So, so he's told them which army is making the main attack. Okay, okay, cool. Well, well, what does Monty say since it's not him? Huh? He's going to try to make it anyhow, but um, that's, not, that's not what his boss wants. Is that just how things work in Tunisia? Because the Axis were doing that too, and that didn't work out too well for them. Okay. Okay, yeah. April 23rd, 1943. It was he who masterminded the surprise attack against Pearl Harbor. He who predicted the Japanese would have six months to run wild and secure their empire before having to fight to defend it. He who has been pulling the strings time and time again and guiding the Japanese Navy's course in this war in his capacity as commander of the combined fleet. He, Isoroku Yamamoto. And this week, he, Yamamoto, dies. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Axis in Tunisia pulled back to their Enfideville positions near Tunis. Soviet attacks in the Kuban failed, the Germans made plans for a huge offensive to hit Kursk this summer, and Isoroku Yamamoto's aerial offensive Operation Ego came to an end the 16th. And he decided to go to the Solomons and congratulate the air crews in person. There are many sources that document the events that follow, but the book 2,194 Days of War does a good timeline breakdown, and I mostly use that for the following. If you want more detail about this story and the intelligence war in general, check out our Spies and Ties series that Astrid hosts. It's very good stuff. Anyhow, a radio message from Yamamoto's flagship Yamato is picked up. Even encrypted, the radio operators recognize the name Yamato and send the message to Washington, D.C. It's deciphered and passed on to Naval Secretary Frank Knox and not only says Yamamoto is about to tour the Solomon's bases, but the timetable of his flights, the flight plans, the strength of the fighter escorts, everything. At 11 a.m. the 17th, Knox talks to Henry Arnold, Air Force Chief of Staff, Charles Lindbergh, consultant, and Lockheed's chief engineer. Him because the Lockheed P-38 Lightning is the only long-range fighter on Guadalcanal. Knox weighs up the advantages and disadvantages of mounting an operation to shoot down Yamamoto's aircraft. On the one hand, the danger of letting the Japanese know that the Americans have their secret code. On the other, the possibility of getting rid of one of the most brilliant enemy strategists, a man of legendary charisma able to inspire his men to acts of fanatical heroism. Knox wants to go for it, and the experts say it's doable if the planes carry extra drop tanks of fuel. The message is sent out to Henderson Field on Guadalcanal with the details at 3.35 p.m. It's received at 5.10, and they choose pilots and discuss when they want to hit him. Six planes will be in place to attack Yamamoto's plane, with 12 more giving them cover from its fighter escort. The whole night is spent readying the planes. At 6 a.m. the 18th, two Mitsubishi bombers take off from Rabao. Yamamoto is in one, and his chief of staff Matome Ugaki in the other. They have six escort fighters. They climb to 5,000 feet and head for Bougainville. At 6.20, the P-38 Lightnings take off from Guadalcanal. At 9.34 a.m., exactly on time, they spot the enemy, drop their spare tanks, and head into attack. One minute later, the escorts draw off Yamamoto Zeros, and furious dogfights begin high above. There are two P-38s who have been given the main job, and they suddenly and unexpectedly climb from the very low altitude they've been sneaking in at and shoot down both Mitsubishi bombers. One lands in the sea and Ugaki is rescued by a Japanese launch. The other crashes in the jungle and Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese combined fleet, dies. The American planes are ordered immediately back to base. They have lost one P-38 and six more have been damaged. The Japanese have lost both bombers and all six of the escort Zeros and Yamamoto. The Americans never announced this victory and the Japanese do not figure out that their codes are insecure. They will make the news public in May and morale will take a hit. In June, at a ceremony in Tokyo that over a million people attend, Yamamoto's ashes will be buried. But Japanese codes and messages are not the only ones that have been broken or intercepted. The Allies 
can read Axis radio traffic in North Africa. And that results this week in what the Axis will call the Palm Sunday Massacre. This is part of Operation Flax and happens on the 18th, Palm Sunday, when 100 Axis planes leave Sicily with supplies for the men in Tunisia. And nearly 50 of their number are destroyed and several dozen more are damaged and forced to crash land. 20 more are shot down the 19th and 39 on the 22nd, including 16 of 21 Messerschmitt Gigant transports carrying fuel. Operation Flax, which began the 5th, was designed to sever the Axis aerial supply route into Tunisia. And by the time it ends the 27th, we'll have destroyed 432 Axis planes for the loss of 35 of their own. They have destroyed more than half of the German transport fleet. But realistically, the Axis really have to rely on air transport at this point if they want to get in any supplies whatsoever, because at sea, Allied mine layers north and east of Tunisia became so proficient that Axis vessels were forced to cross the Sicilian Straits through a single swept channel a mile wide and 40 miles long. Ultra eavesdropping revealed ships' manifests and sailing times in such detail that Allied targeteers could select their prey on the basis of which cargo they most wished to see on the Mediterranean floor on any given day. A solitary, pathetic scow carrying fuel or tank shells might draw 50 attacking planes. In March alone, more than three dozen Axis ships had been sunk on the Tunisian run, and with them nearly half the military cargo and fuel intended for Arnhem's forces. As for the Allied ground attacks, the general outline of which I covered last week, Commander Harold Alexander wants Kenneth Anderson's first army to make the main thrust. This is based on the easier terrain coming from the southwest for his tanks to go over than Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army coming from the south. But this, of course, does not sit well with Monty, who even wrote in his diary last week on the 12th, it would be all right if Anderson was any good as he could do it all, but he is no good. So Monty launches an assault this week against the Rocky Hills towards Enfidaville. This seems likely to be fairly tough, since it is terrain that favors defense, but his intelligence thinks the Infidaville fortifications are but lightly held, and he is convinced he can just run the enemy out and get a chunk of the glory. His first rude awakening is an attack on the limestone Mount Takrona around midnight the 19th by Bernard Freiburg's New Zealanders, specifically the Maori of the 28th Battalion. It's eventually taken the 21st, but with such casualties that it is a Pyrrhic victory. The 4th Indian Division attacking at the same time against Jebel Garci to the west also takes huge casualties for little gain. For the first time, the enemy seemed to be willing en masse to fight to the last cartridge. A new homicidal desperation fired the battlefield, stoked by the savage intimacy of boulder-to-boulder -boulder combat and the Axis recognition that the next step back would put them in the sea. So Montgomery calls off the attacks and decides that if his men cannot force their way through the hills, then maybe they can force their way up the coastal road. He issues orders for preparations for an attack up Highway 1 next week, and then heads to Cairo to make plans for the invasion of Sicily. As for Anderson's first army, he's planning multiple attacks along a 140-kilometer front this week instead of concentrating his force. This because he figures the Axis forces are so fuel-starved, they won't be able to fight off the multiple attacks of Operation Vulcan. Ninth Corps is to attack on the right to draw off enemy forces facing Fifth Corps to the left. But 16 hours later, Fifth Corps are to then attack down the Megerda Valley. Then the next day, the Americans on the far left are to attack towards Bizerta. But as we've often seen before, the Germans don't wait around for things to happen, and they launch their spoiler attack Operation Fliederblüte, Lilac Blossom, on the 20th, Adolf Hitler's birthday. That's done on purpose as a little tribute. However, this attack fails by the night of the 21st. At 3.40 a.m. the 22nd, Anderson then launches his offensive, and by late the 23rd, Good Friday, the 6th Armored Division has punched a hole over 15 kilometers deep in the enemy lines. But the 9th Corps offensive seems to be running out of steam as the week ends. As for 5th Corps, they attack at 8 p.m. the 22nd, starting with 400 guns, 
but already by dawn the 23rd, they are behind schedule and are hit hard by German gunners. Their goal is Longstop Hill, which you may remember was the goal at Christmas, and which absolutely must be taken before any tanks can go up Highway 50 to Taborba and Tunis. It is double peaked, and though Jebel El Amera, the western peak falls, Jebel El Rar still holds out as the week ends. As for the American attacks, which begin at first light today the 23rd, they meet stiff resistance. Attacks to try to flank the enemy meet the 5,000 men of Division von Manteuffel, well dug in for 30 kilometers between Jefna and the Mediterranean Sea. You know, I said last week that American commander George Patton had complained about the Americans being essentially left out of the main final assault to destroy the Axis in Tunisia, and that Alexander and company eventually decided to have them in. And so this week on the 18th, 2nd Corps relieves British forces around Beja before making these attacks. But as they set up, there is one person conspicuously absent, George Patton. He has quietly given up his command to prepare for Operation Husky, the assault on Sicily. Omer Bradley arrives the 22nd to replace him, and those American attacks that begin today are the first under his command. The planning for Husky has been proceeding throughout the spring. Now, the Allies think there are two German divisions on Sicily, and they might be reinforced from the Italian mainland. This all concerns Commander Dwight Eisenhower so much that twice so far, he's told the Joint Chiefs that it might be too risky. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill responded to his concerns the other week. I trust the Chiefs of Staff will not accept these pusillanimous and defeatist doctrines from whoever they come. We have told the Russians that they cannot have their supplies by the Northern Convoy for the sake of Husky. And now Husky is to be abandoned if there are two German divisions in the neighborhood. What Stalin would think of this when he has 185 German divisions on his front, I cannot imagine. But on the 17th, Bernard Montgomery's chief of staff, Freddy de Gingan, reviews the latest plans with the British planning staff in Cairo, and he concludes that it really does not, in fact, have enough concentration of force to assure success. Today, the 23rd, Montgomery flies in to talk to everyone. He will tell Harold Alexander that he is worried because the plans assume the Germans and Italians will not mount a really serious defense of Sicily. And he thinks that is just not true. I'll go over the basic plans and the basic conflict next week, since everyone meets again then. There is another operation that is put into action this week that is related to Husky, and that is Operation Mincemeat, a deception operation. This involves dressing up a corpse as a British officer, putting fake letters in his pocket saying the Allies will invade Greece and Sardinia, and that Sicily is just a feint, releasing the body off the Spanish coast so it gets picked up and taken to the Axis powers, and, well, okay, this is covered in great depth on our Spies on Ties series, which once again Astrid hosts, so you will have to check it out there for details. There is an Axis operation that begins this week as well, Operation Neptune. Okay, got to backtrack. Last week, Soviet North Caucasus Front Commander Ivan Maslenikov's attacks in the Kuban had failed once again. So Stavka will send 460 fighters, 165 bombers, and 170 IL-2 Sturmovik ground attack planes down. So by the next Soviet offensive, there should be some 1,200 Red Air Force planes total in the region. However, this week, Richard Ruoff launches his German 17th Army counteroffensive Operation Neptune to destroy the Malaya Zemlya bridgehead. The Soviet 18th Army there has more than 20,000 men with armor and artillery by now. Wilhelm Wetzel is to conduct the attack with some 28,000 men, half of them Romanian. And though Ruoff does not think that alone they have a real edge, he does think Luftwaffe support and naval support cutting off reinforcements will tip the balance in his favor. However, as the sun comes up on April 17th, the launch date, ground fog and cloud cover mess with his plans. His mountain troops move to take Mount Meskako, the first planned objective, but the Soviets are dug in on the summit. Luftwaffe support fails and the attack is called off when the whole division starts getting demolished. Apparently, almost all of the company commanders are casualties even. Wetzel 
is unaware that this attack has failed, so he orders the 125th Infantry to hit the center of the Soviet perimeter. They attack with basically no support and fight all day to advance some 700 meters. Vetso reorganizes his forces and then tries on the 20th to split the enemy in two right down the middle. This time, he has close air support, assault gun batteries, and Nebelwerfer rocket launchers, and they push more than a kilometer into the Soviet lines. Soviet reserves stop the advance, however, and in this, they are very ably assisted by the Red Air Force. Yevgeny Savitsky's 3rd Fighter Aviation Corps has just arrived with six regiments of Yak fighters, and they take on Luftwaffe Flieger Corps 1 head-to-head -head and drive them off. I should point out that many of these Red Air Force pilots are veterans, and the VVS, the Soviet Military Air Forces, enjoy a 5-to-1 advantage in fighters in this theater. This is the beginning of a period of aerial action here, which I'll talk more about next week. For this week, after the two following notes has come to its end. Adolf Hitler meets with Hungarian leader Miklos Horthy at Klesheim Castle near Salzburg. He brings up the subject of the extermination of the Jews, which has not been proceeding in Hungary as it has in occupied Poland or the USSR. Horthy says the Jews cannot be exterminated or beaten to death. And they are starting a campaign to prove that actually this week when the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising begins the 19th. This is covered at great length in Spartacus' War Against Humanity series, but 1,200 Jews armed with 17 rifles begin the fight against the Axis occupiers, as over 2,000 Axis soldiers armed with machine guns and howitzers are brought in. You will very much want to check that out on War Against Humanity. And the week ends with the Axis powers holding off attacks from their little chunk of Tunisia and launching ones from their little chunk of the Caucasus. Axis supply lines in a dire state and the death of one of the major players in the entire war. And that is a big deal. Really, one of the major figures of this war. The guy that really forced America's hands, dead. He is replaced by Admiral Minichi Koga. Who? Yeah, exactly. How do you fill shoes like that? Yamamoto's body is found the 19th by a search and rescue team. It was thrown clear of the wreckage. He has two bullet wounds one to the shoulder and one to the head. And the doctor examining the body says the head wound killed him. Isoroku Yamamoto did not believe that Japan could beat the US in a long war and that Japan's only hope was a lightning strike using naval air power, which was incredibly forward thinking, and then seizing and fortifying an empire quickly and strongly enough that it would be too much of a hassle for the US to fight to take it back. He very much misread the American mentality. He was right that naval air power and carriers were the future of warfare. And he pretty much himself ushered in the age of the aircraft carrier, ending the age of the battleship. Just so you know, Minichi Koga has never been a big supporter of naval air power and was always one of the battleship advocates. He has seen, of course, what naval aviation can do, but has yet to fully come around to it. Whatever happens now, it is suddenly quite a different war. Although realistically, I could say that just about every week of 1943 so far, and it would most often be true. Wait, wait, gotta listen to the next part, because it's important. This is where I ask you to join the Time Ghost Army. See, we want to cover 1943 and all the rest of this war, and it is the army like these newest officers, that finances all of that. And you want us to do that, right? Then join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. We even have a Time Ghost Army member of the week, and it is Colin Kelly this week. Thank you, Colin. Well, go do that, and subscribe, of course, and I'll see you next time.